very good morning i am dr janak patel today i'll be showing you one very interesting case which you may see in your everyday practice so we are going to discuss on one interesting case now you can see here this was the person who came to me when he looked straight can you make out anything if you look properly this is a very nice nasolabial fold and if you see here this is little less if you compare this to see this i and see this this is little more open actually because of this cap you cannot see clearly but we'll show you in a subsequent photographs that there is a furrowing here here almost there is no furrowing now when he was talking with me you can see this face there's a very nice nasolabial fold this angle is pulled up this angle is drooping this nasal area is drooping you can see eye is more open and there is no furrowing here clearly you can see while there are furrowing here and when he when you ask to close the eye you can see this eye is closed completely there is a very nice nasolabial fold this angle is still drooping there is hardly any nasolabial fold here this side nasal is drooping and see eye remains open person cannot close the eye completely and there is no furrowing here there is no furrowing here this is classical bell's palsy so this is called right side bell's palsy now i'll show you now i'll show you this how exactly you make out now see this yes now when he is trying to close the eye you look properly i can't do it he cannot and while he is closing the eye look at the eyeball eyeball is rolling up can you see now just look at the eyeball again aankh band karo jab eyeball is rolled up aankh kholo ve aankh kholo again have a look aankh band karo can you see very well now this is called bell's phenomena very very typical in bell's palsy and see this eyeball this remains open and there is no furrowing here while there will be little furrowing on this side and you can see this eyebrow eyebrow is still up person cannot close and see this particular eyebrow here you can close nasolabial fold is prominent this angle is drooping down very very typical ah this is bell's phenomena sir okay thank you so now we are going to discuss little bit regarding a bell's palsy it is called as a idiopathic facial palsy or we call that as a bell's palsy now what is bell's palsy it is a idiopathic palsy or we called as a bell's palsy it has to be unilateral very very rarely it is bilateral it is lower motor neuron type of facial palsy means it involves orbicularis oculi and all other facial muscles plus what we call as elevators it is acute in onset 4 hours to 5 days duration 
and there is no apparent cause that's why we call that as idiopathic facial palsy and most important part does not involve any other cranial nerves and they also include one more things in this it should not be due to it should not be due to any neurological damage to brain in absence of other cns signs or any signs of ear disease then only you can call that as a lower motor neuron facial palsy which is commonly because of involvement of the facial nerve in facial canal and that is given a name bell's palsy now the commonest etiology they say that it is either because of microcirculatory failure or vasa nervosa or maybe because of viral infection maybe ischemic neuropathy maybe a autoimmune reaction or maybe an entrapment theory and the most common cases are because of herpes simplex virus other is it can be because of herpes zoster or it can be cytomegalovirus in lyme's disease or epstein barr virus but you can also see a lower motor neuron palsy in other cases also now this particular bell's palsy most common cause of the facial palsy in almost 50% of the cases and it is a lower motor neuron palsy age very common between 25 to 30 years but it can occur at any age you can see this person is little more age male to female ratio is almost equal 1 to 1 left side or right side involvement almost same but unilateral is the most common very very rarely bilateral during pregnancy the incidence become three times more than non pregnant woman and in a diabetic it is almost 4.5 times more common than a non diabetic person once a person gets a bell's palsy the chances of recurrence rate are almost 10% and 60% of the person who get the bell's palsy will have a history of previous upper respiratory tract infection and the most common cause of respiratory tract infection would be a viral infection now here i would like to show you a one small diagram which shows you that from the pons once it comes out facial nerve it will enter the interacoustic meatus along with the eighth cranial nerve the eighth cranial nerve will come out and this will enter inside this is facial canal in that facial canal first know what it gives out is greater petrosal nerve it will supply lacrimal gland which will give rise to lacrimation then second branch is to stapedius muscle which will have acuity of hearing then there is a third branch we call as a cauda tympani branch which will combine with the lingual branch which is a branch of a fifth cranial nerve and it will supply anterior two third of the tongue taste sensation and once it comes out of stylomustoid foramen it gives out a one sensory branch which supplies the skin behind the ear we call posterior auricular nerve and then there are branches we call as a temporal branch zygomatic branch buccal branch mandibular branch cervical branch and this will supply all the different muscles of face on one side so usually the damage is between ex internal acoustic meatus to stylomustoid foramen and this is what we call is a damage in the facial canal and because of inflammation there is an edema and that produces from entrapment neuropathy and this is the common pathophysiology for bell's palsy now if you see this now supply it has got a brachiomotor supply parasympathetic supply and parasympathetic supply is to the lacrimal gland sphenoidal sinus frontal sinus maxillary sinus ethmoidal sinus and nasal cavity out of which we can make out lacrimal gland because the person will have persistent of a lacrimation so when i cannot close person will have a continuous lacrimation and because i cannot close person will have a damage to cornea conjunctiva etc can take this and person will constantly complain of watering in the eye 
sensory supply is to the external acoustic meters and little bit behind behind the ear pinna taste sensation to the anterior two third of the tongue is via cauda tympani now which supplies anterior two third of the tongue and also palate via greater paratorsal now this particular we don't test when the person is having a bell's palsy you should test for sugar salt etc but don't test with a bitter solution now once it comes out of stylomastoid foramen after coming out from stylomastoid foramen it will have posterior auricular branch it will also supply posterior belly of digastric it will supply stylohyoid muscle which this two muscle will take part in deglutition while temporal branch will supply frontalis belly and orbicularis oculi these two muscles are supplied by upper part of the facial nucleus and which is bilaterally innervated hence this is not affected in upper motor neuron palsy because this upper part of the facial nerve nucleus is innervated by the same side pyramidal tract as well as opposite side pyramidal tract while zygomatic branch buccal branch mandibular branch and cervical branch they arise from the lower part of the facial nerve nucleus this zygomatic branch will supply the muscles which takes part in smile etc facial expression buccal branch will supply buccinator and upper lip this will help in blowing of the cheeks whistling pursing of the lips mandibular branch will supply the lower lips and orbicularis oris which will take part in pursing of the lips and depression of the lip while platysma is supplied by the cervical branch and that cervical branch will supply platysma which takes part in depression of the mandible hardly any function but still that is there so this is what it is being all these muscles are affected because the upper part of the nucleus and lower part of the nucleus both are affected in a lower motor neuron and it will be on the same side where there is a damage so it is axillateral damage so person frontalis belly takes part in wrinkling so whenever it is affected there is there will be absence of wrinkling of the forehead orbicularis oculi take part in closure of the eye so person will not have a closure of the eye and because the eye cannot close while closing the eye you will see that the eyeball is rolling up and this is called bell's phenomena as eyeball does not close completely eyeball remains open and as the eyeball remains open it is exposed to the external environment dust particles etc which will produce irritation and there will be damage to conjunctiva cornea etc and that will produce ulceration inflammation etc as well as when lacrimal gland is producing lacrimation this as you cannot close the eyeball the lacrimal secretion cannot be drained into nasolacrimal duct it will overflow and it will appear on the face and person will say that he is having continuous watering of the eye because orbicularis oculi is affected person cannot purse the lip and he will find difficulty in whistling as well as there will be drooping of the eye drooping of the angle of the mouth on that side person will have a dribbling of saliva and when he tries to swallow liquid the liquid will dribble out from that particular drooping angle buccinator takes place in puffing of the mouth and it will help while whistling so person will also find difficulty in whistling when you ask the person to show the teeth those are dilator muscles of the mouth and person when he tries to show the teeth on the damaged side there will be drooping while on the non damaged side person will have a elevation of nasolabial fold and that side angle will be elevated platysma can help in downward movements 
of mandible. Now you can see here, this is the upper motor supply that is we call pyramidal track. This side pyramidal track is supplying, supplying two fibers, one fiber to upper part of the nucleus, second fiber to lower part of the nucleus, as well as same side pyramidal track supplies only upper part of the nucleus. So upper part of the nucleus is supplied by the same side as well as opposite side, while lower part is supplied only by opposite side pyramidal track. And you can see that this upper part supplies only two muscles that we call as orbicularis oculi and frontalis belli. This is frontalis belli. They say that there is another muscle called colligator superchili. So these are the two muscles, but mainly we call frontalis belli and orbicularis oculi. So these two muscles are supplied by upper part of the nucleus, while all other muscles that is nasolib nasolabialis, elevators, depressors, orbicularis oculi, buccinators, platysma, etc. All those are supplied from lower part of the nucleus. Hence, if you get damage here, you can see this, this both supply is affected. This upper part and this is also affected. But this part is having a second supply from the same side. So, this portion that is opposite side lower part of the face will be affected in upper motor neuron. So you can clearly see that this will be in upper motor neuron. Only lower half of the face is affected. While upper half of you can elevate the eyebrow, you can open and close the eyeball. So these two are spared. While in a lower motor neuron, if you get the damage here, both these fibers are affected, whether they are supplied from same side and opposite side. Both are affected. Hence, person will not be able to elevate the eyebrow. You can see here, he cannot elevate and he cannot close the eye. While here, he can elevate the eyebrow. So there will be furrowing. Here, there will be no furrowing and first this eyeball will remain open. This is very, very characteristic. Now you can see here that when you get a damage here, again, this side, upper part is spared, lower part is affected. So in this lower part, you can see that this particular portion, he cannot lift. So this particular is nasolabial fold on this side will be absent. You will be able to elevate the eyebrow. Person will be able to close the eye. There will be drooping of the angle and this nasal will be also drooping. There will be drooping of saliva, etc. But difference between lower motor neuron and upper motor neuron? This side person will be able to elevate the eyebrow, furrowing will be present and person will be able to close the eye. While if he gets a lower motor neuron on this side, you can compare this two. Person will not be able to elevate the eyebrow, so there will be no furrowing. Person will not be able to close the eye and this side will be also, person will have absence of nasolabial fold. And this will be on the same side, while here it will be always on the contralateral side or will be opposite side. You can see very clearly here, when you have got lower motor neuron, furrowing is absent, person will not be able to close the eye for completely, nasolabial fold is absent, this nasal part is drooping, this angle is drooping, there will be dribbling of saliva from here, person will not be able to whistle and when person tries to drink any liquid, that liquid will dribble out from this angle. This is a classical presentation of what we call as lower motor neuron palsy and it will be always on the same side. So we again say that Bale's palsy can occur at any age, at any time. It is a lower motor neuron facial palsy, mainly unilateral. From two days, that is 48 hours to five days, person will have a classical Bale's phenomena. You will have, invariably, you will not be able to find out the etiology but the commonest etiology is a viral. So we call idiopathic because there is an involvement of a facial canal. Usually person will complain of pain behind the ear. This is the most common thing what will be in a clinical presentation. You can see here the eyeball is rolling up. This is a typical Bell's phenomena when the person tries to close the eye tightly. Here he can close 
you can see furrowing here there is absence of furrowing this eyeball is rolled up there is no laser labial fold prominence this angle is drooping and this eye this side face is absolutely flat absolutely flat so person will be complaining of pain behind the ear very commonly because of mastoid foramen area we call there will be effect on the taste and hearing person might complain of tinnitus hearing disturbances person will find difficulty in raising the eyebrow and so there will be absence of furrowing person will also find difficulty in closing the eye and because he cannot close the eye he will have a injury to conjunctiva and cornea and continuous watering there will be flattening of the nasolabial fold there will be accumulation of the food inside the cheek inside this particular that side buccal cavity area there will be drooping of the corner of the eye from where the saliva will dribble out and while he is drinking water even that water will dribble out so on examination you will see that there will be absence of forehead recurring that is because of frontalis belli eyeball closer will not be present that is because orbicularis ocula is also affected when a person gives a smile on one side there will be elevation of the angle of the mouth but on the affected side the angle will be drooping so that's why it is given a name white smile person will not be able to whistle person will not be able to even blow the cheeks because while blowing the cheeks buccinator orbicularis oris zygomatic muscles etc takes part so this is how we ask the person we ask the person to show the teeth open the mouth close eye elevate the eyebrow raise the eyebrow then person is also asked to blow the cheeks whistle purse the lip etc and when he is doing all this activity observe so this is how we do it here you can see both side furrowing is present you ask the person to elevate the eyebrow try to observe that and you forcibly elevate the eyebrow and ask the person to close the eye you will see that the affected side will not close completely and ask the person to blow the cheeks and compress that on the side where it is affected person will not be able to blow properly and the air will dribble out or will blow out from that side angle so this will be very peculiar in case of a low motor neuron palsy you can see that here both side wrinkling is present and here both side person is able to close the eye tightly so it is normal ask the person to blow the cheeks and whistle person will be able to whistle clearly and here person will be able to blow the cheeks properly so absence of forehead furrowing loss of nasolabial fold dribbling of saliva dribbling of food accumulation of food on that side buccal cavity excessive lacrimation inability to close the eye there is a overflow lacrimation drooping of the angle of the mouth cannot blow the cheeks acuity of hearing is affected bell's phenomena pain behind the ear on the mastoid process and even there is a loss of taste we call adjusia these are all the classical finding on one side we call that as bell's palsy here you can see that same on this affected side there is no furrowing you can see the furrowing clearly this eyebrow is not lifted up here you can see that eyebrow is lifted up the eyeball remains open there is no nasolabial fold you can see a clearly nasolabial fold this nasal part is elevated here this is a drooping of the nasal part so drooping nasal this is drooping of the angle of the mouth you can see this is open you can see the teeth clearly here here you cannot see that particular and this side there is no facial expression so we call that as a smooth face these are all the findings what you can come across in a case of a bell's palsy this is one condition where you can come across if you see this crust this is post herpetic crust and whenever you see this crust on that side there was herpes zoster infection and on that side if you get a bell's palsy that is called ramsay hunt syndrome classical this is very very classical that is bell's palsy due to 
herpes zoster is called as a ramsay herpes syndrome now you can see here this is a lower motor neuron where entire half of the face is affected on the same side upper part as well as lower part while in case of an upper motor neuron upper part is spared there is wrinkling eyebrow can be lifted up person can close the eye nicely and lower half of the face is affected while damage is on this side that is we call opposite side so when there is a contralateral lower part of the face being affected we call that as upper motor neuron and which is characteristic of damage to the pyramidal tract we call as a stroke so this is that particular and along with stroke so whenever you get a damage here say this is damage on the right side will get effect on the left side lower half of the face so face is affected along with that arm is affected speech is affected that's why this is given a name fast so whenever you want to examine and differentiate between upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron look at the face in the face when only lower half of the face is affected and on that side upper limb and lower limb are affected and if speech is disturbed suspect upper motor neuron palsy of opposite side or we call stroke on opposite side as far as management is concerned most common treatment which is being utilized is corticosteroid corticosteroid will reduce the inflammation and may help in early recovery antiviral agents are only useful if you have confirmed the diagnosis of viral infection then only antiviral agents are useful usually after 3 or 4 days of bell's palsy antiviral agents are usually of not of much use you have to protect the cornea and for protecting the cornea continuous moisturization cover the cornea by eye pad and then protect with the glasses when person does not recover after a continuous good quality of a physiotherapy usually you go for a gold plates in the upper eyelid because of the weight that will drop down and eye ball will close in some condition where the facial nerve in a early state does not recover you can go for the facial nerve decompression and usually facial nerve decompression is very useful in a person if he has got an aberrant artery which is compressing the facial nerve in that case the decompression therapy is very very helpful and person can have a complete recovery the most important part is physiotherapy so in a person who develops sub bell's palsy physiotherapy is a must and in that physiotherapy usually you go for a electrical stimulation and physiotherapy so ideally we say that there is no specific treatment for bell's palsy electrical stimulation warm moist heat along with the course of the nerve this may be helpful protection of the eye is a must massage of the affected area sometimes is recommended but not of much use person should do the exercise of blowing the cheeks closing the eye puffing wrinkling of the forehead etc in a physiotherapy and keep the eye moist and cover the eye when he is moving about and cover with a eye pad and cover with a eye glasses surgical intervention is very rarely done that is internal decompression external decompression no anastomosis and no grafting is a rare thing which are required in a person who does not recover from bell's palsy and this is what is being done in an acute intermediate variety or a chronic variety in an acute variety you can go for a decompression you can go for a nerve repair like primary nerve repair or a graft in a intermediate nerve transfer can be done or cross facial graft can be done in a chronic variety muscle transfer is being done and free muscle transfer can be done if person does not recover even after 2 years these are all the different types of therapy what are being done but rarely they are indicated as far as a complication is concerned person can have a persistent urgusia corneal infection corneal ulceration keratitis and sometime person even develops a white spot in the cornea which will have difficulty in vision person can develop a chronic facial spasm person who has got an abnormal innervation 
he can have a crocodile tears it is also called as a bogoda's bogor bogorats syndrome or gestato lacrimally reflex so when a person tries to chew person will have a lacrimation there is a due to wrong innervation person can have a sink kinesis can have a tics spasms can develop contractures person can have a partial recovery there is something called as a gestatory sweating we call as a fres syndrome and because person is having that peculiar facial problems and the face distortion he find psychological problem social problem he cannot attend the social gathering etc these are all the different effect what you can get in a person who develops a bell's palsy but by and large good number of people recovers completely within a short period here i end my lecture now i am showing you some photographs which you can see here can you identify which side it is now if you look here following is present eyebrow is lifted up nasolabial fold is seen so this side it is normal upper part lower part is normal but this side furrowing is absent eyebrow is not lifted up so upper part is affected nasolabial fold is also not seen clearly drooping of the eye drooping of the nasal there is no facial expression you can see this facial expression there is no facial expression so this side is lower motor neuron palsy so right side lower motor neuron palsy and in, on this side you can see both side furrowing is present both eyebrows are lifted up so upper part is working on both side while here lower part is working here the lower part is not working so this is only lower part of the face is being affected so this will put as an upper motor neuron and in upper motor neuron it is a opposite side damage so it is a left side upper motor neuron facial palsy again similar way you can see here there is a lifting of the eyebrow here we cannot show you furrowing person can close the eye this angle is lifted up this angle is drooping here this person cannot have lifting of the eyebrow so upper part and lower part both are affected so this is a palsy on this side so like that here both are working this side is not lifted up this side is lifted up so this side what we can call as upper motor neuron palsy so damage has to be on our opposite side so this is this side so this is left side we call upper motor neuron palsy this you can go through slowly and have a look so here i will end my lecture i hope this will be very very helpful to you because you will see such patients in your everyday practice and you should be able to differentiate upper motor neuron facial palsy from lower motor neuron facial palsy